Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. Follow us on Facebook. You can also follow us on Spotify and iTunes. Uh, be sure to also hit those affiliate links in the description of the YouTube channel where you can find direct links to some of the products and items that we're talking about throughout the episode. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. We got a great show for you today. We're going all the way back to the time when we were teenagers, and you got your music news from rock and roll magazines. Yes, before mm. the internet. We will mm -hmm. get into all that, talk about some of our favorites from back in the day and some of the ones we still read uh, today. But before we get into that, Jason, what's going on with you this week? I am having a good week. Uh, well, you know, the week is, we're starting a new week, technically, I guess. But I'm doing good. Um, I guess we had some more weird weather uh, the past couple of days. Uh, it was a... Uh, it, it was raining buckets out where I live, and, uh, you know, the property held up pretty good. So good. that's good. Yeah, that's good. Because it could have, you know, shit storms can be bad, right? Especially in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, you don't expect them because uh, the room, you know, people outside of Texas, wait five minutes, the weather will change. Exactly. Yeah. It's, that's just pretty much it all the time because we don't really have seasons. It's literally going to change in 10 well, we, minutes. So. We, actually, we have all the seasons in the space of an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty much kind right. Of, yeah. I, um, I got some cool uh, scores over the past uh, week. Uh, this first thing is I got from... Um, our, our last episode, I wore uh, a shirt, uh, a promo shirt for Lone Star Metal, which is Rusty Connors' uh, magazine and website and management company. Yes. And Rusty. Rusty Connor is awesome. He's a local show promoter out of the Houston area. And uh, he's, a, he's a killer buddy of ours. And uh, he sent me that shirt I was wearing, which... Uh, I, I forgot to bring up, but all, all good. I'm sure it'll make a reappearance. But he showed me this. Uh, he he sent me one of these. These are this was made in Spain. It's a bootleg, um, and it it's it's heavy duty. It's really thick. Uh, it's probably pewter or something. And I don't want to get it too close to my camera, but you can see how big that thing is. It's a pissed, dangerous toys pissed badge. And look at the weight. Look, look at the, look at that. That and is the, sweet, dude. The detail on it is amazing. The only bitch I have about it only has one post on the back, and ah. this thing is so heavy, it's he like weighty yeah. and kick ass that it, they should have put like three of put, three, you know, put a, put a padlock three, on it, two or three posts <laughs> on that thing, or or like rivets that come with it or something. Padlock. Um, it's really kick ass, and uh, I think I may have said it already, but he he got this in Spain, and uh, just eBay, right? Super and, cool. And boot, it's a bootleg, and we can talk we can talk about about that later. Um, uh, but that's really a cool piece. Yeah. It, uh, for it those is, of you just just listening, uh, this thing, uh, if you know the the record, Dangerous Toys, pissed the the detail of the artwork this is an embossed i mean it's like i could make a a pencil rub on paper of this and it would show you know what i mean it's yeah it's detailed as shit yeah anyway i got that and um very nice it is very nice and my I got favorite this. dangerous toys record by the way nice. it is a good one yeah i got this um have you heard of this company called uh I think I'm reading it right. Hawk Pucky. <laughs> no, but I like the name. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I said it. I said it wrong. Puck Hockey. Um, it's spelled P-U-C-K. Second word H-C-K-Y. Um, they do hockey merchandise, okay. but they but they also do like custom things, and they do licensed uh, merchandise. 
And my buddy, Ted Bob. Hey, Ted Bob. Ted Bob. Uh, we hung out yesterday, and he had a, a late Christmas gift for me, which he shouldn't not he should not have done this. This is this stuff is super nice. Um, it's high quality merch that the and it's basically um, this company does uh, warm ups and jerseys and you know sp sports related type. And I'm not sporty spice whatsoever, <laughs> and I don't wear red. <laughs> I mean, I can wear red, but I feel like Santa Claus when I wear it, right? So, yeah. but the fact that this has the kill them all, Ooh, that, look at that. Dude, that is and, awesome. And the laces, it has a V-neck thing, and the laces are black and white, and there's, look at them, they're super thick. Uh, so what is they're that, like a It's like hockey, yeah, it's a hoodie. Uh, it's got, they're like hockey skate laces. You get it? Uh, that's yeah, and nice, it, this is a V-neck. This is super... Y'all are going to have to watch the video, the the YouTube version of this episode to see. I mean, the quality is sick. Look at yeah. this. This is the right sleeve. It's got a printed logo right here, Metallica, Kill em All. Look, all the names of the songs. Oh, my God. That's awesome, man. Here's the other side. Here's the, the other, I'm sorry, the other sleeve. Yeah, here. yeah. Oh. <laughs> has the proper font of kill them all the kill them all kill, like kill them all so you haven't seen the back yet so oh, man it gets better it kind of does <laughs> and it, it's a hoodie and it's 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 bright effing red it's, yeah. it's like uh it's fire engine red so i need to back up for this this is the grand finale here let's see it oh man kill them all takes up the entire back of this hoodie that yeah, in the in the proper logo, and they and they wanted to make it so big, the the letters that they stacked the words, yeah, like kill, um, all, and the and Metallica then, logo is small on the bottom. So yeah. this company is kick ass. It's not my go to because it's sporty, and I'm not sporty at all. Yeah, um, that's pretty. I mean, cool, sure, yeah. I like I like motorcycles and cars and. You know, I'll, I'll watch a football game if it's on, but I'm not looking for it. I don't yeah. really care about it. Yeah. But the fact that my friends who do, uh, they see cool shit and they, it's nice of them to think about me. So I want to thank Ted Bob for getting this for me. That is and super cool. It's a man. super nice. It's like, um, but dude, when I was wearing this last night, it's beautifully comfortable. Yes. Beautifully. This is, it's totally licensed. Here's the, the license on the bottom left, you know, by the, by the, by the belt of it. Yeah. It's yeah. totally licensed. They, wow. you know, Metallica makes a dollar off of this or something. Wow. I mean, this is, I thought this was kind of interesting and this must be a thing that I, I just don't know in the, the hoodie, the pullover in the hoodie pocket. Like I've got my hands in the pocket. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's another smaller pocket with a Velcro thing. And yeah. I guess that's for your keys. Yeah. Nice. Right? That's really cool, man. And and I'm High really quality. impressed. I'm impressed that it's officially licensed. So Metallica approves. Well, and that's the thing, is like if you look this this uh puck hockey company up, they'll make a custom thing just for you. It's kind of like the way uh converse you can go to converse and make design your own shoes yeah it's the same thing they do that we need to do a talk louder hoodie uh, I, i'm afraid what one hoodie would cost us <laughs> i'm yeah, afraid exactly. to know but uh exactly. super cool um they do have a long line of licensed you know heavy metal bands and and uh other companies that you might want to support that are done in the style of this. And I might be talking out of my ass a little bit because I didn't go look at that website, but I do know that that's what the kind of thing that they do. They're that's basically a marketing company that's uh, all related in hockey slash sports. Yeah. Whatever. Nice. Super I like cool it. swag. Right? I like it. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Um, this segues nicely into uh, my little spiel. Um, I uh, 
had a visit from uh, our our dear friend Sean Weingartner stopped by yesterday. And we haven't hung out in person probably in over a year because of COVID, right? And he texted me and he told me that he's been hanging on to a birthday gift for me, which when he got here, we realized he's actually been hanging on to it since my last birthday. So (laughs) he's been holding on to this for a year. And you know, you you know, but our listeners may not. Sean is a first of all, he's a super cool dude, but he is the ultimate record collector, and he's the kind of guy that goes out there looking for uh, imports, oddball first pressings, European pressings, uh, albums with typos, all these things that make uh, LPs collectible or whatever. So he bought me this, and. I'm I'm showing it on camera right now, but for those of you, it's got a bit of a glare. It is, there we go, something like that. Joe Perry, it's a Joe Perry, it's a Japanese pressing of Joe Perry's third solo album called Once a Rocker, Always a Rocker. And as you can tell, it's a Japanese pressing and it's got all the Japanese uh language print on the on the back cover and the sleeve insert and uh super super cool um oddly oddly enough uh sean didn't realize that he bought me that album uh a couple years ago it was also the same lp um and that version was a promo copy and when i got it and i opened it 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 contained the official press release from the album release back in the day. That that album came out in 1983. So it contained the official press release and also an 8x10 glossy black and white photo that was intended. You have two of the same record, but one's an American promo? One is an American promo and one is a Japanese pressing. So yeah, wow, two of the same copy of the album, but both unique in their very own ways. And both of them courtesy of our good friend, Sean Weingartner. And we hung out and we, we, you know, we got to, you know, talk and catch up and it was just so good to see him. It, it's just wonderful to have a human being, you know, in, well, and, at your house. And you know? your buddy, your buddy Buzz came into town as well. That's correct. Yeah, he was. In fact, he just left. <laughs> I told him, uh, I got a podcast to do, bro. You're going to have to hit the road. But uh, yeah, it's been huh. the first, it, it was the uh, first time I'd seen him in over a year. So yeah, finally starting to uh, reunite with some friends and family. And uh, it was great to see Sean. Um, he's such a sweet guy, really cool dude. And he knows his rock and roll upside down, inside out. It's he's, it's It's incredible. So now I have two copies of that Joe Perry LP, and they're both unique in their own little peculiar ways. So thank you, Sean. Nice score. Thank yeah. you, Sean Weingartner. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. um, he's kind of a he's a guru. You know, he gave me a copy of this book. You know, the infamous book. I have one too. He gave he it like, to me as well. Yeah. So yeah. he's probably the biggest buyer and collector of those. Just so people like you and I who are in the nerd club can actually have a copy of that book. You know, that book is, do you have yours nearby? I do. Can you hold that up for a second so we can get like the legit title? I don't want to mangle the title of this collectible. This is a book while he's holding it up. This is a book that I have the same book. Wow. Yours is in really good condition. Um, what does it say? The Headbanger or just Headbanger? Uh, it's called Headbangers. Right. And uh, the foreword is by Ted Nugent. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Sean's going to have to leave comments and correct us on all this. Yeah, but that's I, fine. I, think, I think my copy actually came from a library. Uh, I think mine did too. Mine has some kind of sticker on it. Yeah. And so so for people that are listening, what it is is basically a an encyclopedia of sorts where it catalogs all these various bands and has little yeah. entries about when the bands were active, who their band members were, what albums they put out, et cetera. And it goes it, from A to Z. Would, would it be safe to say that it's a glossary of exactly how you just described? Like if you look at Mickey D, 
it's got every band that he's ever been affiliated with, what instrumentation he did, whether he contributed any backup vocals or whatever. It goes as deep as possible. Is that would that be a good assumption? Uh, I, I I think you you probably can't look up Mickey D by name, but you can look up his various bands. You know, look up Motorhead, uh, Dokken, uh King Diamond. And yeah, but I think that you can look up a name. You might be able to if you go in into the back, the back and yeah, they'll tell okay. you what pages he's mentioned on. So right. it's a glossary. The entire book is is set up that way. Yeah. Now, now the crazy thing is. We have a lot of friends that are actually in the book. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It really is cool. And yeah. So, so when Sean moved to town, well, actually, I met him in West Virginia a few years before he showed up in Austin. Right. Yeah. And when I met him, he had that, that book under his arm and had me sign the the various pages or page that I'm on. I, right. Because I'm I'm in there a few times. Yeah. Or twice, at least, with Watchtower and then the toys. Yeah. The coolest part about this book, or let, let me finish talking about sh shit about Sean real quick, is it, when he moved to town, he was, I think he had moved a couple of times over the, the first couple of years he was here. He got rid of a bunch of vinyl. He got rid of a bunch of his collectible shit. Yeah. He was letting stuff go. Yeah. And then once I think he got settled, he started to up the ante and he started hanging out with Rodney Dunsmore, who has the biggest, I mean, his house is a record store. Yeah. I'll yeah, say I, it again. His house is a record store. N nothing's for sale, but his house is like, a, here you go, a record library. It's a museum. Yeah. It's, it's a, a heavy metal vinyl. Store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, well, it's like a head shop slash collectible <laughs> poster store magazine store any kind of uh, pulp that has to do with rock and roll yeah it's like a rock and roll library there you go yeah um yeah. and sean is probably a baby rival of that uh yeah. in in all of the best ways um Th this book, uh, you know, Sean would carry it around to shows that were coming to town, or he'd even fly with his a pet book, book yeah. to, to run into people that are in the book and have them sign it. Yeah. So even if uh, a band was only around for a short time yeah. that, that never even reached uh, an official release status... Like if they just has a series of demos, they're in the book. Yeah, that's how um, thorough this is. Now I don't know the guy's name off the top of my head that did this book all by himself. This is done. Here, here's the clincher, pre-internet, which yeah. means everyone he spoke to, all of the timeline. All of the demos, all of the magazine articles, all of the magazines, all of the interviews he's read, all of the were all done physically. Like he had to dial phone numbers. He spent it. Talk about a labor of love. Yeah. No exactly. Google, no Google, no wiki, nothing. This yeah. was all done by either knowledge he had that he fact checked on his own, went thumbing through his entire personal collection as well as just putting it all together. This book came out, I think it's had two different pressings, but I think the last pressing was done in 93. Yeah, it's it's very hard to find. And uh, in fact, when Sean gave me my copy, he told me that he had to jump through some hoops to, to find find it, you know, because it's, yeah. uh, it's not widely available. It came out, you know, 100 years ago. But... The cool thing, like you said, it's basically a dictionary of hard rock and heavy metal. And if you flip through it, all the entries, you know, from Anthrax to Zebra or whatever, uh, Sean has taken this book with him through over the years to all these concerts and had all the various band members autograph them. And and it's become, it's become sort of a living, breathing entity all to itself. Like people, people know the the book as it's called, you know. Right. 
and right. and one of the cool things is Sean is currently posting uh, the stories behind the autographs on his Facebook page. If you're interested, oh, you should cool. check him out. Go look him up. It's Sean S E A N Weingartner W E I N G A R T E N E R. Did yeah. I get that right? I hope I did, Sean. Uh, uh, but I anyway, I think it's uh, W E I N G A R T N E R. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Gartner, right. Yeah, Sean Sean Weingartner. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah, uh, and, his, and, and he's got the book on his Facebook page, and he's starting to post uh, little blurbs about where he got the autographs and the stories yeah. behind uh, the meetings with these Before people. I forget, my uh, I held up my new, my fresh metal blade reissue of uh, Nuns Have No Fun, Merciful Fate that I got from uh, End of an Ear. I, I wonder if I forgot to throw a shout out to uh, Victor Guerrero. I want to say, hey Vic, thanks for for looking out for me because I've been I've been looking for that that reissue. Thank you very very much, sir. Um, so so listen, we could talk about that book and thumb through that book since we both have them. We can, yeah. and we're not in the same office right now. We could actually look stuff up. So here's what I was going to say about that, and then we should get into our main topic. Yeah. Dude, that book is hard to stump. Yeah. Here's one that I like. What was the name of the band that Phil Campbell played in prior to Motorhead? I'm going to go with Persian Risk. Very good. But see, who knows that retarded information? Me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We are. What does that say that about me? You know that. Yeah, well, it says a lot about you, my friend. Do you remember who sang for Persian Risk? Oh, my God. Now you're going too deep. Uh, John Deverall, singer for the second singer for Tigers of Pantang. Boom. All Isn't right. That crazy. That's crazy go. shit right there. This is what this, yeah, this is what the show is about, and that's what the book is about. So welcome, geeks and yeah. nerds. Yeah. The, the, the more the more lame you are and cheesy you are, <laughs> the more you are welcome. Exactly. Dave, take us into the main topic. Let's do it. All right. Our topic today is rock and roll magazines. Now I want to say that uh, Jason and I are of an age when, um, how do I put this gently? Let's just say we're old and there was a time when the internet didn't exist and the way you kept up with your favorite bands was through the printed page, magazines. And uh, if you were a kid like us in the 70s, 80s or whatever, you couldn't wait to spend your lunch money on the latest version of whatever was the popular magazine of the day. And you couldn't wait to read about your favorite rock bands, your rock and roll heroes, et cetera. And you wanted to peel the, the, the centerfold poster out of it or tear the page out of it and hang it all over your bedroom wall. That's what we're talking about today. And I'll let you start, Jason. What was the first magazine that you remember collecting for the purpose of keeping up with rock and roll? Well, I think I that once I got my first Kiss poster, I wanted more Kiss posters. This is always the gateway, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so, so I've got, I don't know, four Kiss posters on the wall. But, but once you have one Kiss poster on a wall... There's sometimes, and most of the time, I found that there's not enough room for another Kiss poster next to it, even if you move it over. I would have been boarding up the windows just to make more poster space. <laughs> How old are you at this time? Oh, probably 11. Okay, go okay. ahead. So I love my parents for letting me ruin my room and my mind. <laughs> so I've got, I've got Kiss posters all over the room. Okay, we'll... Fast forward to, I'm at the grocery store with my parents, just tagging along, of course. I'm, they're buying groceries, and I'm tagging along, and I'm getting lost in the magazine racks. Yep. Everyone is, everyone watching this is going, yep, me too. They're talking to the, they're talking out loud, saying, yep, me too, that was me. And I couldn't, you're, I love your question, because I don't have the, correct answer but it's going to be as close as i can get it's probably going to be circus or hip parader yeah yeah um i can't i mean maybe rolling stone but that was seemed 
like it was over there with a different kind of magazine. And it seems like it's always been over there with a different kind of magazine. Yeah. Because I think Rolling Stone was not, maybe originally it was all music, but I think that they, they talked to different inter types of entertainment industry. Yeah. Yeah. So and more of an industry magazine than, than it is a fan type of a, you know, where they're interviewing, uh, you know, Brian Johnson about how he got the new, how he got the gig in ACDC yeah. or, or if it's before that, uh, you know, Paul Rogers, how they're talking about how free turned into bad company or something like that. Yeah. But, but back to my kiss posters, I was on a mission to find a picture of anything kiss that would fit in the wall space I had available. Yeah. And I'm talking, if the cover of the magazine, ha I'm holding my fingers like two inches apart up to the camera. If there was a picture on the front or just on a leaf leaflet or an ad of Gene with his tongue hanging out or spitting fire or Peter Chris crossing the sticks or whatever, I would beg my parents to buy the magazine, which was probably only like a dollar fifty back then. It's cheaper than uh, that, I'm sure. I... I, I would, they would say, sure. And I would cut out this picture and hang it in the space of it. If I had a little spot, <laughs> Hey, I missed a spot. Yeah. I would hang that tiny ass picture. I would just lick it and stick it. Yeah. And, and I think that at some point I finally did run out of room, but it took, it took years to do that. Yeah. I, I, re I remember it well because I'm going to go back even farther than Circus and Hit Parade, or at least I don't think I was reading the magazine, by the way. Right? Yeah, yeah. You were, you were, you were uh, looking for the photos and the. I pictures. didn't care about reading at that point, right? Well, the the first magazine I remember collecting uh, for the for the very same reason you described was a magazine called Sixteen. And it was the numeral, it was the number 16. That was the title of the magazine. And it was it was totally a teeny bopper magazine. It was all about Sean Cassidy and Leif Garrett and Scott Bayo, But they also included Kiss. And just like you said, if there was a corner of the front cover that had a picture of Gene or Paul or Ace or, you know, Peter... Um, that was good enough for me. I bought the magazine and that was one of the first magazines I remember looking for at the grocery store while I'm with mom uh, because I knew that's where I was going to find my kiss news, you know, and they, they seem to feature kiss on a regular basis because kiss was part of pop culture in the 70s, oh, yeah. you know, big time. So I could count on that magazine for at least giving me a glossy full page photo or, you know, in some cases, you know, one of the guys from Kiss was the centerfold of the magazine. So you, you, you pulled it from the staples and you hung it on your wall, just like you described. And some of the earliest things I had hanging on my bedroom wall when I was a kid were from the pages of 16 magazine. And again, it was not like, um, uh, you know, all these years later, looking back in hindsight, it probably the article that accompanied the kiss photo or whatever was probably not that great or in depth or whatever. But in those days, that's all you had. You didn't have the Internet. You didn't have MTV. And so you took anything you could get your hands on. Right. And so kiss in a magazine at the supermarket was was pure gold man and who cares if the next page is leaf garrett and sean cassidy and win a dream date with scott bayo or whatever you know christy mcnichol yeah christy mcnichol hey there you go mm -hmm. exactly yeah. but yeah so um, i remember my brother my brother and christy mcnichol had the i think i had scott bayo hair and uh my brother randy had christy mcnichol hair yeah i, I think i probably awesome yeah, I probably yeah. had the Scott Bayo at one time too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. like Scott Scott Bayo on a bad bad day because yeah, I, exactly. I think my hair was longer than Scott Bayo's. <laughs> um, but I had the feathers, you know. So it yeah, was, but, well, we all did at some point. So the that was you're talking seventies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. so when you think about sixteen magazine, it's not necessarily. A magazine you're looking for you're looking for 
you know, what gets, what gets you. You're right. looking for fire and demons and rock and roll right. and blood and, and right. It and it things. wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a true rock and roll magazine. It wasn't dedicated right. to rock and roll. It was dedicated. It was a teeny bopper magazine. So it was dedicated to teen uh, popular culture. And yeah, all and you're and you're not even twelve. Yeah, I'm somewhere you're right in that You're going, oh, I got to get there. And you're probably got some, maybe some looks from your parents. Maybe not. Maybe they were used to it by then. <laughs> 16 Magazine, you're not even 16. What? Are you, this is inappropriate. What yeah. do you mean it's inappropriate? It's got my heroes in it. You know, right. that, that kind of thing. That's why it's inappropriate, because there's Gene Simmons uh, spitting blood or whatever. Well, maybe 16 Magazine wouldn't even, you got to think about this. This is interesting. I'm not saying that they were necessarily censoring because they didn't really do that back then, if you kind of think about it. They didn't really censor it. They there were doing whatever it took to sell magazines. Yeah. So they yeah. were probably talking about, to you know, the interview in this issue of 16 is with Paul Stanley and, and talking about his love life or yeah. something. You know, it was, it was more about the entertainer and not necessarily... You know, how many cats does Leaf Garrett have? Right. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. It wasn't delving into the recording process of the Destroyer album. It's more about what's Gene Simmons' favorite food. You know, that exactly. kind of thing. Exactly. It was more uh, stats. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It but was... that, that, that's the first one I remember collecting it strictly for the purpose of gaining information on Kiss, you know, yeah. and that, and back in the day, uh, I'm sure some of our listeners can relate. That's that that was your source. You didn't have the internet. You didn't have MTV. Uh, you, the only way you could see and read about bands was picking up a mag, a gossip mag, a celebrity mag, or whatever. But then I graduated to what I like to think. Uh, I, I won't say these these magazines in hindsight to me, you know, we're, we're not necessarily the greatest magazine, but they were at least dedicated to music and rock and roll. And that would be hit parader and circus. And those two were kind of peers. They were kind of, uh, around at the same time and covered the same bands. And I remember buying those because they were all about music. They were dedicated to music. You didn't get the leaf Garrett and the Scott Bayo and the Christy McNichol. You got, you know, uh, Queen and Bad Company and Led Zeppelin um, and and uh, and Cream was another one that was in in the mix. Yeah, at the same time. Yeah, that was a huge magazine. It's uh, still a big deal. I think that they have a website that you can. Uh, they order. just did Mer a, somebody Merchant. just did a documentary on that oh, okay. magazine, and I need to see it because I've heard it's great. Yeah, oh, I'm you, sure. And you would probably yeah. love it too. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, Cream Magazine is definitely one of the magazines that's in there with Circus and Hip Parader that um, didn't actually reach my lip service earlier. Um, the um, I, I wanted to point out that that those magazines, those three, um, you could... I, I remember, for the most part, maybe not every look, cover... Uh, they had a feature entertainer in, in, in a in a, a long photo, right? Yeah. Um, the it would like Freddie Mercury or something, right? Yeah. But then they would have on either side they would have the lists. They would have the lists of uh, feature articles or 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 other smaller articles that were also in the magazine, and right. they would also mention whatever was the centerfold, the pinup, or whatever. Um, they would also maybe mention whatever, some kind of contest or giveaway, either they were sponsoring for an artist um, or or a product even sometimes. Coca-Cola presents, da-da-da, you know, and the magazine would 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 make money from Coca-Cola or whatever it was that stuff is rampant today. That's exactly how, yeah. how things work. Well, I think that the Rock magazine was a, was a player in that whole thing because it, there's no internet so rock and roll people love coca-cola i mean they like other things too but they love coca-cola you know so see what i mean so how whatever is going to work and they can team up and have a meeting on the golf course you know yeah. the money changes hands and it's a it, they sell coca-cola but they sell magazines too and that's just the the beginnings of all of that 
Um, and Rolling Stone was a huge player in that. They they probably started that shit. You know, yeah, as far they, as rock and roll ma- entertainment magazines, they probably started that. Yeah. So, because they were, I mean, they started out as like a newspaper type of a thing. Yeah. A print thing. And then they went glossy and their issues got bigger. Like they were, took up more space on the, uh, on the rack. So yeah. they were over there with those magazines. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about Rolling Stone magazine a bunch of times in this episode, but I'll, I'll, I want to say this because it's kind of funny. I paid attention to, to Rolling Stone magazine, but I never bought Rolling Stone magazine because I'd always get to that page that just smelled like perfume. Because <laughs> they were selling some kind of fucking perfume. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, this is not a rock and roll magazine. And I'd put it away and I, my hands would stink. <laughs> You know, they give a sample inside the magazine. Yeah. I don't know what year they started doing that, but I started like that was like that. You know, I, I'm allergic to thanks a lot, Rolling Stone. I'm allergic to cologne because yeah. of you. so anyway, back to like circus or hip parade or they would have like I said, I described it. Da, 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 and I remember that specific and it was easy to scan with your brain that way to know what you needed to look for. But you know what? Sometimes that didn't work. Somebody would say, man, did you get the new hip parader? It has this picture of Gene riding a chopper or whatever and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, what? No, I saw the magazine, but I didn't. And so what I had to start doing is if even if it didn't have my hero mentioned on the cover, I would still pick it up and spend the time. So sometimes we'd get home from from grocery store and I'd get on my bike and ride back over there because I wasn't ready to leave. Because I wasn't done studying the magazine, yeah. quote studying, looking for the right photo or whatever. Yeah. And so I would sk- I would try to skim through every rock and roll magazine that was there, just in case I wouldn't be missing. I didn't want to miss anything. It became a, a ritual. Yeah, I remember um, uh, circus, especially circus. I, I was I was more. I was more of a circus guy than hit parader hit parader just struck me. Even at a young age, I could read it and tell that it was basically just a regurgitated press release. There wasn't anything necessarily uh, in depth or revealing about the bands. It was, it was very uh, basically just an ad, you know, it Mm. was disguised as an article, but it was basically the press release. You know, I could tell this even when I was in high school, I just, there was something about the tone and the, and the information that was being provided that wasn't really in depth or anything unique, you know? Yeah. Um, but I remember when I was in high school, there was a seven 11 right across the street from the high school I went to in San Antonio and seven 11, uh, you know, convenience store. So it was right across the street. So it was really tempting, you know, all the kids used to skip out of school and run across the street and hang out at the seven 11 parking lot. Well, I used to get my circus magazines there and the guys that I used to hang out with there, you know, 7-Eleven back in those days always had like a couple arcade games tucked away in a corner. And at the time it was something like Tron and Centipede or whatever, you know, yeah, uh, Pac-Man or whatever. And they would start, you know, putting quarters into the game and playing the video game. And I would just sit on the floor flipping through Circus Magazine and, um, I, yeah, I used to buy it religiously. I never had a subscription. I would just go to the convenience store and buy every issue when it was available. Yeah, I think that the the subscript the I don't even think I knew anybody that had an official subscription. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't um, a thing you did. You just went and bought it every. Well, month. that would turn into you know your parents committing committing to, <laughs> to some to you. Yeah, exactly. I don't I don't know committing you know. to your delinquency basically. Yeah, so the um uh, yeah, I was I was calling it a ritual uh, mainly like I said I was I was decorating my room for the most part. Yeah. Um but I was also you know, my I had two different thoughts going while I'm looking for the ultimate, you know, the perfect size. I had I had, you know, I had I'm not getting a ruler out measuring the leftover space on my walls. But but I you know I had a memory of what what was missing in my 
um, Kiss photo uh, photog- photo layer, my wallpaper, my yeah. Kiss wallpaper. Yeah. And uh, so I would learn about, you know, I'd hear about other bands that way. And so when my older brothers would bring home a new record or I would catch them listening to something and it would catch my ears or my eyes, whatever. And I would be like, Oh yeah, I read about these guys. This, wow, this is cool. And it would give me more reason to research, you know, a UFO with thin Lizzie, what, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. So, so I loved that because that was basically the internet. That's how the that's how the networking would begin. Yeah, was you're you're paying attention to things and they're coming at you. You're not writing them down or or right click save. You know, yeah. you're just you're just <laughs> soaking it up because you're a, you're a fan. Yeah, and I used to say this thing all the time. You know, I only know two hundred metal bands because that's all there are. I can name you two hundred <laughs> metal bands because that's all there are. Well. Well, you know, that was in the 80s. Well, now it's, you know, 2021, and there's a new band being formed every five seconds. Yeah. So you can't, yeah. that's going to be the new hot thing somewhere, right? Yeah. So you can't, there's not, but I come from a time to where I could, I could spit out 200 metal band names and not 201 because there's not 201. <laughs> that's how much of a nerd I felt like I was because I had my ear to the track right yeah um this was how it was when i was a little kid too as as much of that was possible i was learning from my elders and um it was it was an awesome time those magazines really helped me out a lot the um i don't know when would be a good point to mention this but you may have some uh some play uh into what into this sort of realization was that Let's say it's you know seven between seventy five and seventy nine, maybe eighty, you know, and this is a time that I'm kind of collecting magazines and buying magazines and worshiping mag you know rock and roll regalia as well as uh, the interviews with my my rock and roll heroes or whatever that maybe a decade later. I would be in those magazines. Yeah. How, it yeah. wasn't, you know, it's not something as a young person, you're going, I want to grow up and be in this magazine. It's not, that sounds dumb. That doesn't, it sounds so out of reach kind of thing. And yeah. then, you know, during that period of you, like riding your uh, Schwinn must, you know, whatever, you know, Stingray bike to the, you know, like a scene out of Stranger Things or some shit, right? Yeah. All yeah. the way to the to the the store or the head shop, which you can't go in the back room through the beads, to <laughs> to look at posters and magazines and records and stuff. This this whole like let's call it training. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know that you're not thinking about like uh, even when you start to learn how to play your instrument, you hadn't written a song yet. There's not. You're just happy to be able to hit the string and make loud noises right 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 that that a decade or or you know maybe 12 years later that 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 i would be in these magazines was like a brain fuck yeah well i i i had a a very similar experience from a different perspective you of course were the performer but i was the guy that ended up writing for some of these magazines but i see but i see it's the same thing it's the same thing yeah yeah same thing yeah that's what i'm saying it's like as as sean weingartner say would say to tame tame (laughs) he says that i got that me and randy say that all the time my brother randy we got that from sean when he's like when he's like talking about something and then he'll talk about something else. And I go, isn't that the, as you would say, the tame, tame, yeah, it's a tame, tame. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a funny thing. He got that from an old friend of his. Maybe he can tell you the story one day. Carry on, sir. But no, it's, it's uh, I had the same experience on a different, from a different angle. You know, you grew up reading all these magazines and then one day you were actually featured in these magazines and your photo was in these magazines and, and they were doing interviews with you in these magazines. And me not being a musician or a performer, uh, but being like an aspiring writer when I was in high school and college or whatever, I ended up being in the magazines as an author. So, you know, my byline was in these magazines 
And it was kind of, it was really cool, man. Cause these were things that, you know, I'm talking specifically about metal edge magazine because after, uh, there's, there's a couple other, but I'm jumping around here, but that's fine. After a uh, hit parader and circus kind of were my go-to magazines when I was in my early teens, I guess. And then metal edge magazine came along and, uh, I just thought it was a much better quality magazine as far as the information that it was offering. You could, you, you could tell that it actually was exclusive interviews with the band members. It wasn't just a regurgitated press. I'm sorry, which magazine again? Metal edge. Metal edge. Right. Yeah. You know, Jerry Miller recently passed away. Yes. I yeah, know. It's terrible. She yeah. was always really, really a, nice to everyone. And, and, uh, champion. came off, came off as a as a fan she was a she really liked her work and yeah uh, was you know hoping the best for your success yeah uh, and would even say so in the interviews and stuff very 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 dedicated to the cause and yeah. uh yeah and uh, uh, really Help, helped a lot of bands uh absolutely forego a lot so absolutely jerry miller rest in peace because uh god knows i read countless editions oh, of your magazine hundreds yeah exactly and then i ended up writing for it but it's kind of like what you were saying um uh metal edge just struck me as a much better quality magazine because it was actually they were actually doing exclusive interviews with the bands and you were getting a little more personality out of it but i want to also i want to come back to metal edge but i don't want to jump over uh i was also a huge collector and by the way all these magazines that we're talking about i have in boxes in this closet behind me i still have them i mean literally those you you can see it but our listeners can't see but i'm pointing at a a binder that's about six inches thick that has just a a a vomitous uh (laughs) stack of all of the above that we're talking about and more other titles that we haven't even mentioned yet. yeah we haven't even got to yet i'm gonna pick it up in a minute so all of the magazines that are not cream hit parader uh rip circus circus. um there's there's even more you know metal edge there's even more than that that might have been uh sort of bandwagon magazines i call them oh yeah like you have like a huge publisher yeah uh that will even do like a hustler you know some porn some porn magazines that will also uh you know hire another few staff members to go chase rock bands and interview you know do their own version of cream or whatever that would be which, rip magazine which i thought was awesome yeah and, and rip was a one of the magazines that was a good sort of crossover between a bunch of different ones rip was a great magazine yeah i feel like they're the way it was uh it was a little more striking their covers by way i i thought here's how i remember it was the the cover was an actual full photograph of an artist yeah with the 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 other entrails you know yeah on either side on on, you know play carefully placed that were superimposed on top of the actual photograph which covered the entire cover yeah 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 rip was a great magazine and i remember it, it's funny that you know as we're having this conversation i'm talking about the magazine so i started with 16 magazine which was basically a teeny bopper celebrity gossip mag um and then i graduated to you know cream and then later a, li- a little bit later hit parader and uh circus which now we're talking about magazines that are entirely dedicated to rock and roll and then um i remember rip just because it was it was uh, like you said the cover was kind of striking and their the logo was great you know it was always off into the upper left corner and the and uh the font was this real jagged sort of torn and frayed sort of looking font and the magazine uh as you alluded to earlier was uh put out by larry flint who yeah. was the uh, publisher behind Hustler, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, he and who recently passed away uh, a year ago, maybe. Mm. Um, but yeah, Larry Flint was one of these publishing 
guys that kind of had a little bit of reach in all different sorts of uh, uh, publications, Hustler being his his claim to fame. But Rip was a great magazine, and that's a that's a that's a Larry Flint product. And Lawn Friend was the managing yes. editor. And yeah. you got any Lawn Friend stories? Because I know about the time that magazine was really hot is also about the time Dangerous Toys was, you know, starting to make noise. So did you yeah, ever meet that Lawn was, Friend? Uh, yeah, hunting with Lawn Friend a couple of times. He was, you know, he'd be hanging out in the commons areas at shows that, that I was at or that I was on the bill or I'd run into him elsewhere. Um, you know, we, we were f definitely friendly, but you know, he's, he's usually hanging out with a bigger rock star than me. So I, I didn't, I didn't really approach to try to get any, uh, FaceTime with him, but always a way of hello and first name basis. And yeah, uh, he, he seemed to be, really dedicated he, to he's just a really nice he's he's one of these guys that's just a dude he's just a dude he's just right. one of us so and a total rock fan and yeah. and you kind of get that and, and while we're talking about him i should mention and and maybe we can throw this into our affiliated links at the in the description of this episode uh he wrote a book called i think it's called planet rock uh by lawn friend and he sort of uh uh just sort of relives some of his experience as the publisher of rip magazine so of course it's all about you know hanging out with rock stars and doing interviews and that sort of thing and, it, and it's and it's really entertaining so if you have a chance to pick that up lawn friend planet rock you know while while you're you're uh mentioning planet rock uh who's it, it, at some point we've got to do this and it might as well be right now you know i talked about me being a little kid at the grocery store thumbing magazines looking for a two two inch square picture of peter chris or gene simmons or whoever else yeah um let's talk about photographers so if there was no hardcore enough rock fan to try to sneak their camera into a rock show in the 70s and in the 80s uh, to get some badass shots, some close-ups, and then knock on the doors of record labels and publishers and maybe send a couple of uh, shots to Rolling Stone magazine, or who to, to Circus, to Hip Raider at that point, yeah. and get there. I'm mainly talking about Mark Weiss. I knew you were going there. He, he has a new book out. I yep. The decade that rocked, and it's all '80s bands, and uh, I am included in the pages of this book. I'm not trying to sell anyone the book, but yes, I kind of am trying yeah, to sell, yeah, sell you someone should. because uh, I I haven't held the book in my hands. Uh, Mark has promised me a copy of the book, but. I mean, it's, I'm just, I'll just say it. It's, it's like, it's like buying a Metallica box set. You're going to spend about 150 bucks on it. Maybe oh. you'll get it for 80 bucks. I don't know, but I'm telling you, it's like a, it's this thick. It's like, you know, three inches thick and it is probably worth every dime. Yeah. I, it's funny that you mentioned it because, uh, as you mentioned at the top of this show, my friend Buzz was here at my house last night for the first time in over a year. And what did he bring me? The very book you're talking about. You're kidding me. I'm not kidding you. It's sitting out on my kitchen table right now, and I was gonna, oh, I, I was gonna, I was gonna share God. that. I was gonna mention it and talk about it a little bit in our intro on today's segment or today's episode, but uh, I haven't yet had the time to sort of flip through the pages and absorb it, and I wanted to be able to speak about it more uh, thoroughly. So I will share that. But I, I, I can tell you. Uh, just from looking at the cover and you know a casual flip through a few pages it's a uh, it's a really great book and and you bring up a really good point because I think it's it's people like Mark Wise and then I'm, I'm going to go back to Rip Magazine uh, Del James you sure who was a you know basically a, a friend of Guns N' Roses when Guns N' Roses was still a bar band yeah and him and uh, Robert John 
photographer Robert John. 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 Another, yeah. yeah, yes. I, good. I, I would always bump into Robert John. Out yeah, there. good mention. He, yeah. yeah, I bumped into him at a, at a GNR show as well. And yeah. it's people like that that started to lend the magazines a certain amount of credibility. Like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, they kind of started off bands were being mentioned in teeny bopper magazines and then the magazines became dedicated to rock and roll and then the magazines started being fed by uh professional photographers and professional journalists who are completely dedicated to rock and roll and that's when you got the good stuff because it was coming from people who shared that passion and uh, you, that's where you get the the Mark Weiss and the Dell James and the Robert John, and you know I, I'll I'll even throw in our our, our dearly dearly departed friend uh, Greg Maston. He was another yeah, local he was, guy. He was a player, yo. He was a he player was a, in that whole scene, man. I I yeah. remember seeing his photos in Circus Magazine and and Hit Parader and uh, uh, inside of Ozzy Osbourne records. That's and, right. Yeah. That's so, right. so 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 you would so you would. Um, some people w wouldn't think anything uh, about the story I'm about to tell, but I started noticing Greg Maston, you know, at shows just as a fan who's got a camera. We'll, we'll stop yeah. right there. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah, they love it, and they're yeah. they're just documenting because it's kind of something that they're into. Yeah, <laughs> and then next thing you know. The show that you were at with Greg Maston, the photos in the new album cover. Yeah. Stuff like that. Okay, yeah. so so here, here's a little bit of a story. This made it really weird. So, you know, I see Greg Maston hanging out in a bar that I'm playing at in Texas and in the 80s. And then, like, you know, a year or two goes by and I'm on tour. I could be in Las Vegas or Los Angeles or Phoenix or New York or whatever. And I look in the pit and guess who's in there? My friend, okay. Greg Maston. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Got to love it, man. Right. So it's kind of like that made it like, whoa, dude. So that kind of puts um, the story you were telling about Rip and the friend, the friends of Guns N' Roses. Well, they're not just the friends of Guns N' Roses. They're it's what it's who they what they do they're yeah. they're in the front on the front lines whether there's a guns and roses or not so yeah and, and greg robert you know, john what wasn't specifically taking shots of axel he was he was shooting everybody just like everybody else yeah, yeah. and i well going i want to go back to greg maston because he was he was in please indir indirectly he was sort of a, a hero of mine because um, I, when I was growing up in San Antonio, he lived in this house off the side of I-35, which is a highway that runs through Texas. And he had this house that he shared with a guy that I was hanging out with. And uh, I didn't know Greg, but I was basically buddies with his roommate. And one day the roommate says, dude, you need to come over to my house and meet my roommate. He's a, he's a total rock and roll nerd, just like you, but he takes photos and he's got all these killer shots of ZZ Top and Def Leppard and Saxon and stuff uh, at the arena, you know, like arena level shows. And I was like, cool. So I went over to his house one day and uh, I'm looking around at the walls and I'm just like, wow. This guy is the real deal. He was probably one of the first people I ever met that actually had their work published. Damn. And while he was a photographer and I was a writer, um, I was inspired by him because I here's a guy that I can I can I can talk to, I can see, I'm standing in his house and he's doing it. He's being published in magazines, he's making it happen. And I was like, I want to do what this guy's doing, except I'm going to be the writer, not the photographer. So he was kind of an inspiration to me in a lot of ways. And um, I still have some of his photos hanging around. We should talk about the Ozzy Osbourne photo. And then I want to get back to the magazines. But I want to I want to give Greg a shout because the people that are listening to this show probably have or, or have seen. Uh, there's an Ozzy Osbourne Greatest Hits album uh, that's got a photo collage inside of it. And one of the photos is a Greg Maston photo and it was shot in San Antonio. It was actually shot uh, on the night that Ozzy peed on the Alamo and got in a bunch of trouble in San Antonio. 
and I'm looking Shame at the photo you. right here in my house. I'm staring at it right now. I, he's had it blown up to what is, I don't know, what is it, a three foot by four foot print and it's framed and uh, it's godly, awesome. But it's, godly size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. the point being that uh, magazines started to evolve and they started to be run and the contribution started coming from people that were really, really into music. And that lent, lent a lot of credibility to the magazines. And I always thought Rip was one of those. And then Metal Edge uh, came along, and I, I remember Metal Edge thinking Metal Edge was pretty good. Um, and then years later, I started writing for Metal Edge, and that was like a that was a big deal for me. It was probably much like your first appearance in a magazine, the first time you opened up an international magazine and saw yourself, you know, in the pages and went. Yeah, wow. it was one of those things where it's a mind blower, and you know, you're calling home about that. Mm hmm. And you and yeah. probably, hey mom, remember that magazine I used to buy when I was eleven years old at the, at, the at the grocery store? I'm in it. Yeah. What? And then, Ma, guess who was thumbing through rock magazines in the grocery store after that? Yeah, exactly. Mom. Exactly. Looking I was the same her, way. It's like, like hey, in there. Yeah. I, it was the same thing for me. I I remember uh, telling my mom that I'm you know writing for Metal Edge magazine, and I wrote for some newspapers you know in the city in, in San Antonio, and uh, I you know I used to get a kick out of the fact that my mom would tell me that uh, all of her her lady friends you know they would get together and 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 quilt and 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 do whatever women they would do. they would do they would do kick ass mom shit. Yeah, they would do yeah. mom stuff. And then and and her friends used to bring clips, my clips from the uh, newspaper because I was collecting that stuff for my portfolio. Right. And I used to just think it was, I used to get a huge kick out of the fact that these, you know, 60 year old women are cutting out uh, interviews that I did with Marilyn Manson or something, you know, people mm -hmm. that they could give a crap about. But they're like, right. that's my friend's son. He's writing for the newspaper. He's writing for the magazine. Mm -hmm. And so it was the same thing when Metal Edge, when I got the gig writing for Metal Edge, it, you know, that lasted I don't know, three or four years, something like that. But it was a big deal for me because I'm now I'm writing and contributing to a magazine that I grew up reading, you know? No, that's, that's, that's a huge deal. Um, and and a, a, a bit of an accolade on its own. Not that you're winning a Pulitzer Prize or an award for writing for a dumb rock and roll magazine, but that's the shit between yeah, us. Yeah. Us rockers, that's like the that's you know you're in the you're you're up in it when you're doing that. Yeah. So, so I want to talk a little bit more about photographers and and your your relevance to. Uh, you know, more people have a Greg Maston photo in their in their you know in arm's reach or on the wall or on an album cover or something than they realize. Yeah. Than we realize. Yeah. So it's it, you know uh, they're they're even though they're almost household names like Niels Lowzauer and and Mark Weiss and, and those guys yeah um, I mean everyone has uh, the Lowzauers because he he took the Randy Rhodes he took the Eddie Van Halens he t did album covers pretty much the he's the uh, Mark Weiss is kind of what we started with sorry Neil but he you know Mark uh, Neil would be the West Coast mark wise okay and maybe even had been doing it a little bit earlier or ironically around the same time just out on the west coast yeah um but you know sli slippery when wet that's yeah. mark wise wow yeah i mean uh mark mark shot the photo of dangerous toys on the back of the day correct album is that correct. right and and he was in town uh shooting uh it was it was get two birds stoned at the same time uh, he was in town <laughs> shooting, uh, he was, uh, Bon Jovi was playing and Skid Row was opening and that was 88, I think. And he's, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, he scheduled a shoot with us. The label had, you know, called him and hooked it up and he, afternoon and we're standing in the Texas sun and we do the photo shoot and everything. And he's like, he's like, what are y'all doing tonight? And we're all like. 
I, I don't know. We were just we just cleaned the, the calendar for you, bro. And he's like, well, good. Y'all are all my guests tonight at Skid Row Bon Jovi at the Frank Irwin Center. I was like, kick ass. So we all went and we went in the backstage and I got there's a picture of me and Bon Jovi somewhere. It was actually in Metal Edge magazine. Wow. A picture of me with John Bon Jovi. Really? Anyway, so we're all hanging out in the dressing room and and Mark Weiss has a role somewhere that he's never uh, released of pictures of me and Sebastian. Oh, wow. Like literally me and Sebastian almost posing, like hanging out, like pointing at the camera and doing shit, you know, back yeah. and back. And, yeah, and I remember Baz over. going, who are you? Why are Mark, why, why are, who is this guy? What am I doing? I, I was laughing. It was like, hey, man, I'm just doing what Mark tells me to do. And I had just met him. I don't know. You know, he doesn't know me and I don't know him, you know? Yeah. I had never heard of Skid Row. It was the it, they were brand new. Yeah, no one no one had heard of them. They were they had they had to prove themselves, and they did. <laughs> they did. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that was like a an early an early moment of what was about to happen to me and to Baz and to rock magazines and to everything that, that around eighty seven and eighty eight. Yeah, I so. I I think. I, I can't stress the point enough that I, I really feel like the magazines gained a lot of credibility once they were uh, put together by people that were passionate about music, whether it was a writer or a photographer or a graphic designer or somebody that understood the music. And that's when the magazine sort of graduated from being sort of a, a, a glorified press release to being actually having some substance, you know? Yeah. And um, one last thing about the photographers, I feel like and I could be wrong, but I don't I don't know if I am. I, I want to say that I'm not wrong, that people like Niels Lozauer and uh, Mark Weiss, they worked for themselves. Greg Maston, too. They were yeah. themselves. They didn't sign a contract to only shoot for Rolling Stone. Right. Right. To only shoot for it. they they just they were they were hustling. It was a freelance gig. It they was, were hustling it, all the time. It was the, the same thing when I when I wrote for some of these magazines. I mean, I I didn't sign a contract that I was their exclusive employee. It was uh, I got paid by the article basically, and I was free to go write for whatever else magazine right. or newspaper I wanted to. Right. Um, I want to hear you talk for a minute about Kerrang because you're a big Kerrang yeah. guy, and yeah. I think it's a really important magazine, and we need to mention it. And I think this uh, segues nicely because you want to talk about a magazine that was put together uh, by contributors who knew their stuff. Yeah. Uh, Kerrang! was uh, pretty much, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better stable of writers and photographers and whatnot. So set the stage for us. Tell, tell, okay. tell everybody who Kerrang! is and, you know, and tell us why you enjoyed it so much, why it's one of your favorites. Right. So to give it a little bit of timeline, I don't even have to say dates to do this, but, you know, to graduate from standing in, at the magazine rack in the grocery store at, at 10, 11, 12, 13, to fast forward to the early to mid 80s where there's this new thing called a fanzine and i do feel like you know we can mention this but i think that we need to do an episode on like tape trading and fanzines all in one because it really is how let's just face it it's how like metallica got signed it's how a yeah. lot of bands were discovered okay so yeah. i graduated from the magazine rack at the grocery store to these like Xeroxed like punk rock underground fan zines, yeah. right? That had bands in it that you were you you had no idea who they were, what they were about, what they sounded like. But this fanzine was put out, they you know, much like uh kids who were in metal bands would write songs and record them and put them on cassettes and lick stamps and send them out. Where were they sending them? They were sending them to startup labels. They were sending them to Metal Blade Records. They yeah. were sending them to, to management companies, maybe. But they were sending them to people who ordered them through a fanzine. Yeah. Okay? So in this fanzine, there's, there's, a, there's an address. You know, hey, check out our band. This is what we kind of sound like. And there'd be an address to the, the singer's mom's house. Yeah. And you would send two dollars 
to this dude's mom's house, and he would send you uh, like a 20th generation cassette copy of three, it could be crap. It could be three lamely recorded, you know, all, which is probably <laughs> what you loved about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. hardcore. It was underground. And that was a, that's a whole movement. See what I mean? We should do it. A talk louder episode on all of that and, and the beauty of all of that and yeah. what it turned into and then you get I'm, I'm i'm in that scene where i'm literally on one side of it where i'm licking stamps and sending them sending cassettes of watchtower to these fanzines and hoping that they'll like it enough to mention you in the magazine and people will send two dollars to my mom's house and i'll have to send out more cassettes and that's yeah, right. Yeah, so fast yeah. forward to, I graduated from those underground fanzines around the same, uh, no, t to those underground fanzines around the same time that I discovered Kerrang! magazine, which was the like granddaddy of what was happening sort of in the fanzines. It was, there was no, I, I mean, in Kerrang! there was ads like there were in glossy hard rock and heavy metal magazines at the time. Rolling Stone would be the the usurper of that, but uh, dude, Kerrang magazine was all about the underground, but had the glossy photos. Yeah, like I heard about Metallica, maybe in some fanzines, but around the same time in Kerrang magazine, like Lars wearing silver spandex and had really short page boy haircut. And they were just really, you know, pimply face young Metallica dudes with a picture of Ron McGovney and Dave Mustaine in there. Yeah. In Kerrang! magazine, full color. Someone had heard about this new band opening for Saxon at the Whiskey, Metallica's first show. And they fly over to the States and they do a piece on them in Kerrang! magazine, which right. I fully think Lars was uh, sort of... Uh, really trying to make that happen he probably called from los angeles to england he's like hey i got a new band let me send you some demos we're opening for saxon and da -da. he's leaving off that it's we've never played a gig before we yeah. rehearse every day but we've never played a gig before yeah anyway kind of situation whether my facts are slightly off there or not doesn't matter kerrang magazine is this magazine that has this kind of things in it but it's a beautiful it's like a it wasn't like a 50 cent, you know, fanzine punk rock style. It was like, yeah. I, I like, I like what you're saying. It, it was basically a professional level fanzine because right. it was, it was written by people that understood metal. Right. Uh, it was shot by photographers who knew what they were doing and it, and it came out in a glossy format and it was very professional. And they had plenty of reason to put Ozzy or Iomi or Ian Gillen or Blackmore or Biff Byford or even, uh, you know, at some point, Jakey Lee or because it was around that time. Yeah. So, and, you know, and, and, you, and we should note we, we should note that this is a magazine out of the UK. I don't, correct. I don't know if we made yeah, that point, but, correct. Correct. Yeah. And and it was a, it was an import. Yeah. You had to spend a couple extra bucks because yeah. it was an imported magazine. Kerrang didn't have uh, any sort of uh, uh, publisher here that was or a or a um, a licensing deal or what have you to stack the magazine to rack rack the magazine I should say. Yeah. And you would guess where you would get this in a record store. There was no Barnes and Nobles. You can go yeah. buy any magazine in the world that if or they could order it for you because it was that was their business. It was a record store. It was focused on rock music. It was sold where you could buy rock records. Yeah. I, I think Kerrang had a huge amount of credibility because of the access that the magazine had to specific artists. And the reason they had that access is because the artists and their managers could tell that this is going to be handled by someone who really gets what we're doing. So right. if you have an option to do an interview with, you know, hit parader versus Kerrang or something, you're going to go with Kerrang because you know that it's going to be perceived as a more legitimate 
uh, dedicated heavy metal publication. Right. Know? If you were an American band and you were in Kerrang! magazine, there's something there's something about that. Yeah, that was that was yeah, you that was a big deal. That was yeah, a that's big a big deal. deal. So that's what I mean about Metallica, a new a new band being, you know, yeah, thrown into uh, an article done about underground bands or even just about Metallica. It may have been one page, right? Maybe yeah. two pages. It might have been a little bit of a spread about Metallica in said issue. This would have been about 81. Yeah. 82. Yeah. Like I said, they were a brand new band. So yeah. Um, I, I have to, yeah, lots of hats off to, to Kerrang for that. But sure. they were like the first magazine like that that would have sammy hagar on one co co you know issue on the cover and then the next one would have cronus from venom yeah on the, they, there was no holds barred yeah they, they could put any kind of rock and music or anything that pat benatar could have been on the one right you know, the next one bruce I, dickinson I, I, on the one after that i so. think that points back to their dedication to the music and not their dedication to the advertiser you know right. i mean was, obviously they had to survive and they and yeah and they probably catered to some bands and some labels, whatever that, uh, bought ads in their magazine, but their content wasn't as dictated by that sort of thing as maybe yeah. some other magazines. And I think that's what gave them again. Uh, the credibility came from the caliber of the writers and the photographers and yeah. the format, but so there, there's one magazine we're, we're talking about the UK. There's another magazine out of the UK that was started out like Rolling Stone as a newspaper print. And it was folded like a newspaper. Of course, it was thinner than your normal newspaper you used to get. But yeah. it was called Sounds. Oh, yeah. You're going back. Yeah. And yeah. Sounds Magazine is like 70s going into 80s. And sound, you know, I think that it was obliterated at some point and obsolete. But that yeah. was the magazine that probably first heard this new band called ACDC. And Iron Maiden my point yeah my, my point exactly my point yeah and so the this is this is where we start to get into the historical relevance of of what this episode is about not just these you know the circus and the hip parader and and things like that this is where it makes those have like those are shining stars but that's where this kind of idea kind of comes from not to mention again uh you know sounds in the uk and rolling stone in america are around the same time yeah so. and the uk had uh nme new musical new music express or new musical yes. express they, yeah. that was sort of a peer of uh sounds and um <clears throat> speaking of the uk i mean man i mean they they obviously do it right uh classic rock magazine is, yeah. is one of my favorites and uh yeah, me too I think that it is so well researched and so well written and the photographs are just amazing. And I've probably said this multiple times on, on talk louder. Uh, you open an issue of classic rock magazine and you see photos that you haven't seen before and right. you get the stories that haven't been told a million times. And that's what makes it so great. Isn't there another one that might even be a, a sister magazine called rock candy? Do you yeah, know that, I don't know that they're. I, I don't related. know. Okay. I, I don't know that they're related, but I think there Rock is... Candy has a record label as well. And let me yeah. throw this up. My our buddy uh, Bob Sutcliffe held up a, a photo in his uh, socials of uh, uh, the brand new reissue of 1987's "Cool from the Wire" with a oh. giant hot pink uh hype All sticker that. on it and oh my god it's it was sealed he hadn't even cracked it yet yeah and he was showing that up look what i got and it, it, it's on rock candy records yeah, so rock candy's that. magazine as well as a record label that that does all these kick-ass reissues they've done angel and I, I who knows who but stuff like that so. yeah i i haven't actually uh held and read an uh an issue of rock candy magazine but i've seen the ads for it and i feel like just based on the ads alone that they're uh they're moving in the right direction it looks oh my like, god yeah you, yeah, you it, would love it it's right up i there. know i i need to get it because maybe maybe one of our listeners will buy me a subscription how about that <laughs> but um yeah i've heard great things about it and again again i will always go back to the quality of the magazine is completely uh 
relevant to who it is that's contributing to it. If you've got a writer who grew up on you know collecting albums and knowing every band member's name and birthday and all yeah if that guy's the one or that girl is the one that's writing the article you're going to get a good article and i i classic rock magazine to me is like one of the best and uh, well there there i feel like that's like uh where it went from kerrang yeah a lot of the kerrang writers i believe are now classic rock uh, writers, there's a there's some overlap between the two magazines or yeah. the writers at least. Yeah. Um, and I, it was it was also an honor to write for that magazine. I wrote for Classic Rock for a couple of years, and I was thrilled because I thought I considered it to be the best magazine on the planet as it relates to rock music. And yeah, uh, it was awesome to be a piece of it. You know. Oh yeah. So yeah, classic rock to me was, uh, you know, still, it's still available and, uh, you know, our listeners can, uh, check out our affiliated links in the description of this episode and, uh, you know, maybe get a subscription to that magazine. If you're a rock fan, you, you'll, you'll love it. It's really well done, well put together. Um, I wanted to ask you, Jason, since we're on the topic of rock magazines, um, this is a question I can only ask you because, uh, I don't fall into the same category, but when, what magazine do you remember being, uh, uh, okay, let me, let me, let me rephrase the question. Which, which national or international magazine do you remember first being featured in as either the singer for Watchtower or Dangerous Toys? When was the first time you opened up a magazine at the local grocery store and went, there I am. Well, well, I don't want to, I don't want to, this sounds kind of dickish if I say uh, that, you know, uh, you know, I remember all of them or I do remember or, or the fact that I just got used to it. Oh, that we're in that again. Oh, okay. What's for dinner? You know, I, I yeah. didn't, I, I, I wasn't recording the, the issues uh, chronologically and, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to collect all of the magazines that I'd ever been in or mentioned in or uh, complaining about them spelling my name wrong or whatever it was. But uh, <laughs> Which I'm sure happened a lot, right? Of course it happens. Or There's they, always an S know, on the end. They, they say, uh, you know, Mike Geary and Mark Watson or something like that. You yeah. Know? Um, <laughs> but the point, the, 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 the answer to your question is it's probably going to be um circus or hip raider uh i mean Met i feel like metal edge was a new magazine around the time that i was starting to show up in those things yeah you know? um i i don't really have I, I couldn't really tell you the name of uh of one or the other that that i actually showed up but i remember probably doing a little dance thinking that it was you know some someone likes me yay kind yeah. of a thing right and uh it was more like uh opening one of those magazines and seeing a full page ad of my this new album coming out and it was my album yeah that kind of shit was like well uh oh there what, you go wow this is cool an yeah. ad in magazine that i didn't have to beg someone to put in or pay for it myself yeah i um at age 19 or whatever right so so uh i remember I, and i i need to think about this but i'm i don't think i'm wrong i think my foot in the door at metal edge magazine was actually writing about you interesting i think the first page the first full page article i had in in metal edge magazine was a profile on you and it was kind of like one of these things that was a it was, I pitched it to the magazine because I was friends with you and I knew I had access to you and I knew that their audience knew who you were. And so yeah. this was a viable pitch, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, I know you don't know me, but I'm a journalist and I, I've got a degree in journalism, so I know how to spell. And anyway, uh, I know this guy, Jason, and I would be willing to like talk to him and do an interview. And if you want to do a sort of a career retrospect or a where is he now kind of thing or whatever and um and uh what our one of our friends was the photographer uh 
Oh my God. His name escapes me. He's a buddy of yours. Um, local dude, but the photo was you playing bass. It was you obviously uh, from the Godzilla motor company. Oh yeah. Was it uh, Johnny Medina? That's the man I'm thinking of. Yep. Yep. Johnny Medina. And so that was my, I think I want to say that was my foot in the door at metal edge magazine. And that article led to like a three, four year run writing for the magazine so yeah look at that fantastic yeah Yeah. but yeah so you know uh you know rock and roll magazines were a were a huge deal for geeks like you and i it's where we got our news before the internet uh i mean i couldn't wait for the next issue to come out and i'd run to 7-eleven and i'd buy it and i'd pedal home on my bicycle or whatever and uh uh, and I still have boxes full of them in the closet right behind me as we're doing this this show. So um, they were an integral part of any young rock fans upbringing. And uh, I think we hit on a lot of the main ones. And there's, yeah. there's probably many others that we omit. I want to I want to roll through um, some of these that I just have a, a fairly random stack. It might be mostly metal edge, but. This is something that I, I wanted to com- try to compare earlier when I said that um, Cream and Hip Parader, and I, I remember Hip Parader, or Circus too, having like the one focused photo with just the typeset, yeah. as opposed to a million different bands on one magazine. Yeah. Metal Edge magazine would have like a thousand bands on the cover. Yeah, just a lot of collage. And, yeah. and I, I get that. I understand that. And uh, I can't really complain because my band was one of the millions of photos on there but yeah. metallics magazine even yeah, do you yeah. know this one you remember yes, this one i do um you know it's called metallics but but it's got you know of course it's got axel it's got uh you know uh, motley crew bon jovi warrant are the centerfolds white lion uh, Sebastian, Mr. Big, but it has Metallica. It's called Metallics, and some of those are not metal bands, so I would I would argue that. Uh, another metal edge that just looks like it's, do you remember you know, do you, hair do you, metal vomit all over it? Faces magazine. You I was that? just gonna say Faces. Yes. Good. So they're yeah. they're doing doing it the way that I feel like is kind of kind of smart. Is that you know there's a giant photo of Skid Row with a small inset of Axel. And in the middle of the big C, remember it had a big C, yep. the logo. Yeah. And they've got actually they've got uh, East Snyder or something. Uh, no, they've got uh, uh, Tough. They've got uh, Tough in there. Stevie yeah. Rochelle. Yeah, yeah, they've got Stevie in there, and uh, um, and then there was sometimes they would do uh. Uh, rock scene magazine which is actually owned by mark weiss now rock scene he bought the 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 rights to that and he owns that now um and this one i'm looking at is called it's rock scene is real small and then giant is skid row revolution and it's just a whole thing and there's you know other bands are in here but 98 percent of the magazine is skid row stuff Here's one called Hard Rock. Did you remember that? Don't remember Once that. Once again, probably an offshoot of um, Major Publisher. Rip of yeah. something or something. Got a giant picture of Baz, smaller insets of everyone who's hot. 1990 kind of thing. Yeah. Here's another one with Skid Row, but there's an inset of me, an inset <laughs> of Tom Kiefer. Uh, and this was just called Metal Magazine. Perfect. Uh, but check this out. The, <laughs> the, the posters inside of here are Warrant and Testament. <laughs> so there you go. I don't, we're we're I, covering I don't, it all. Yeah. Yeah. So here's Hip Parader with the, the square, you know, Hollywood squares. Yeah. So four squares, right? And it's uh, Mark Slaughter, Janie Lane, uh, Baz, and Mike Tramp. Okay. With your insets of GNR, Metallica. Uh, warrant here you go at the bottom they have this like vomit of you know bang tango europe mr big slaughter cinderella enough's enough badlands queens right tough david lee roth dangerous toys scorpions and tesla so nice. kind of vomitous right i i i, I uh oh, there's I'm, some corn and some peas and some carrot you know yeah a little bit busy 
I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up some of these uh, more obscure magazines because I, I remember I running across and I might've shared this story before on talk louder, but um, I remember coming across a magazine called metal shop. Yeah. And there, I still have the issue to this day because it was a, it was such a turning point for me. Uh, and the reason I bought it was Steven Tyler was on the cover. I have a metal shop magazine with Steven Tyler on the cover in my hand right now. Is it red with him going like this with his hand outstretched? It's, it's, it's red ish. Yeah. That's the one dude. Yeah. yeah. That's the magazine that turned me into a journalist. That one right there. Interesting. You, you should take a photo of that and send it to Jared so he can splice it okay. in this episode. But that, I remember buying that magazine, never heard of the magazine. You know, it didn't have a reputation. I just saw Steven Tyler on the cover. And I'm like, I'm buying this. Metal, remember- Shop, Metal Shop was actually a, uh, a radio show. It was, yes. I and remember. I can't remember the, the yeah. DJ or the host's name at the moment. And but they used, what was the music they used for their... It, for their- it was like something like, like John Kay or something like that. But what was the music? What do you remember there? Uh, no, that was pretty good. No, I uh, don't remember any of the music, but I remember you would just talk about metal. You it know? was it was Steeler. It was Ingve Malmsteen. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I remember uh, metal what song. Shop. Uh, I think it was the intro to Hot on Your Heels. Oh, okay, cool. Where he does the guitar solo and then he has this screaming feedback pedal or whatever. Yeah. But, so real real quick, um, I got I've got one called Metal Maniacs. Which, oh yeah, you know, that was a good one. Yeah, Kyle and Nevermore and that Halford, was a good and one. it was all heavy stuff. And Watchtowers actually in that, Iron Maiden giveaway. That uh, was a where, good one. Where that where bands like Nile they were considered like super, you know, hardcore underground, uh, coming from a death metal, a newer death metal styling around that time late 90s uh 2000 i think this issue is from 2000 yeah but weren't afraid they could still put marilyn manson in it because it was kind of just heavier and weirder type yeah. of stuff um that was a good one you know they would also have god smack in there too uh yeah. but what about burn from japan i was gonna mention burn that burn that was... i have a lot of issues of I, that's sort of like a classic rock magazine just japanese style i feel like it's more of a kerrang but uh, but again classic rock is sort of an offshoot in in some ways of kerrang so yeah right. as but far as ads and posters and yeah, uh and, and the and look putting yeah. megadeth mr big and europe on the cover you know yeah i'm sort of holding one with rob halford and dave mustaine on the cover and then i have another one right next to it with Kerry King and Philip Anselmo appropriately on the cover. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's pretty much just like a, a, a bucket of, of rock uh, right here next to me. And these are yeah. all in, in plastic sleeves and a huge binder. That's awesome that you have that. Well, um, I have a ton of these. So. I, I remember the, the, the Steven Tyler cover on that Metal Shop magazine because that was the magazine where I was flipping through it one day and I realized somebody's getting paid to write these articles. Yeah. So the Steven Tyler uh, cover on that metal shop magazine, I remember opening the magazine and flipping through it. And and that's when it occurred to me that some, you know, somebody's getting paid to write these articles. Somebody's getting paid to interview these bands. And I thought, this is what I need to do. It was the moment, you know, you you hear all the time uh, musicians decided, um, I, this is what I want to do when they went to their first concert or they, or they saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show or whatever. Well, that Steven Tyler cover on that metal shop magazine was that moment for me. That's when I went, somebody's getting paid to do this and this is what I want to do. Yeah. And that was the inspiring moment. And that's why I still have that magazine. I, I, I love the fact that you have it as well, but that was the one where I was like, okay, I'm never going to be the onstage musician, but maybe I can be, you know, the guy that does the interviews and writes the articles and that sort of thing. That was sort of my inspiration was that one particular magazine. Well, you know, we can we could probably talk about this in another episode, but the fact that, you know, you had some kind of calling because you're pretty damn good at it. 
uh, just being a journalist and writing about whether you're doing reviews of car parts for uh, a, a, a place in a magazine or you're interviewing Eddie Van Halen for Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, you're a journalist. You you write about what you, what you know. You you got to make the donuts. You got to write about what your boss you know what what gets you the food on the table. But yeah, um, the fact that you're able to dabble in both and and make it a thing. I mean, I don't know if Mark Wise or Niels Lozauer ever had to take a picture of you know hubcaps, but they right. might have. They might have to pay the rent. Who knows? Yeah. God knows I've written about plenty of stuff I could give a crap about, but my passion, of course, is music. And it was nice to, at some point, get paid for, you know, not that it ever yeah. paid the mortgage, but it was nice sideline money and that sort of thing. And it, it kept me in the game. And I, I, I actually enjoyed doing it. I like the craft of writing, much like you, I, I, I imagine you enjoy the craft of writing a song, you know, it's the same way for me. It's like, I want to tell the story better than the next guy. So I'm going to dig deep with my questions and I'm going to reach out to the publicist and I'm going to find the person I need to talk to in order to get Ozzy Osbourne on the phone or sure. Metallica or whatever. And then I want to be the guy that tells the story better than anybody else. Well, learning how to use, <laughs> learning how to use the resources that are out there. I mean, in my world, if, if, if I know a guitar player and I'm looking to get in a band or write some songs with someone, you, you start using your resources like that. You don't wait for them to come to you because then you're, yeah. you're father time going to catch up. Right. Yeah. Well, this yeah. has been fun. Yeah, this has been fun. And I wanted to uh, stress the importance. I, I think a lot of people listening to this episode, a lot of our listeners in general can relate to the uh, the time when you got all your music news from the printed page and you were a fanatic. So you went to the 7-Eleven and you bought every issue of Cream or Circus or Hit Parader. And you remember peeling out the the page size glossy photo and sticking it on your wall and covering your whole bedroom and that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to, I wanted to spend an episode talking about that because it was really important in my development as a music fan and eventually as a writer. And, and for you, it was a, a starting point as a fan and eventually somebody who was featured in those magazines, you know? Yeah. So yeah, very important but stuff. If you know anybody with a with a copy of the hardback, uh, the book that we held up earlier, the Headbanger via Sean Weingartner, gifts to myself as well as Metal Dave, um, that will open a can of worms for heavy metal and hard rock trivia all day long. You want to play Stump the Trunk? You can stump the trunk with that book right there. Yeah. I guarantee Eddie Trunk don't know half of that shit. Yeah, it's pretty extensive. And here you go. What was what was Mickey D's first band before King Diamond? Ooh, uh, Geisha. Okay, I would have never guessed. Geisha. That. See what I mean? It's stupid. No one's gonna know that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the beauty of it, though. That's now, the, now, in, now in the uh, in the comments, Sean Weingartner. Actually, it was not. Yeah, Geisha. Yeah, yeah, It was that was actually called, his third band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were called Red Velvet or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, good episode on rock and roll magazines. They were a very important part of my uh, youth, and I still read them to this day. So I um, wanted to give a shout to the, all of the authors and publishers and photographers who you know, pour their hearts and passion into giving us something, to, some way to keep up with our favorite bands. And Well, and it's a, a point out again that now that the internet and wiki and all that stuff, and you can see the new photos, well, hell, you, you can walk up to the front of the stage and take a photo yourself. You don't have to stand in the grocery store anymore and thumb through the magazine. <laughs> First three songs only and no flash. All, well, of, we, all, all of you professional hope, photographers will get that reference. We hope they would follow that rule. Yeah, mm. yeah. Let's move on to our shot of rock and roll. Dave, bootleg cool or bootleg lame? Uh, we could um, do a whole show on that. You realize that? Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to have to say lame, and and here's why. Um, as a collector, I, I think it's cool because you want something unique and original and kind of underground, that sort of thing. But by and large, first of all, uh, 
the band by definition the band has nothing to do with the bootleg release and therefore i think that it's typically sketchy quality and is not fairly representative of the band and for that reason my my sympathies go out to the band because i know that if i was in a band and some guy in a garage uh captured a rough mix of one of my concerts down at the local dump and tried to release it as an album i would be pissed because it's not representative of the quality of the work that i'm capable of so right. mm, i sympathize i sympathize. bootleg bootleg t-shirt in the parking lot guy across the street hey this one's 10 bucks don't yeah. buy that 50 dollar one buy the same thing what do you think I, yeah i mean i i get it um i wouldn't buy one myself because i know from experience that the quality is the, the shirt's going to dissolve in the washing machine the first time i put it through from but, your experience that's that's your experience with it yeah i mean i think that's pretty fair to say i mean the reason they're selling it for 10 bucks is because it cost them 10 cents to make it you know right. and and it shows and I, I i'm one of these people that i i guess because i have a certain uh understanding and sympathy towards what it takes to put something out it, it, you know I, I want to favor the band and I want to favor the artist and I want to favor their intentions. And I want to support that if I choose to support it at all, I could choose right. not to buy anything, but I'm not, um, especially a recording, you know, I might, I could see myself buying a bootleg t-shirt possibly, but I really have a problem with bootleg recordings because I don't think that it's fairly, it's not representative of what the band would want. And the band doesn't make any. The, it's not a band. Uh, it's not official, right? And you and you make no money off of it. And you yeah. Had so, no, you had so no sometimes, stay. sometimes the band can. I mean, it's happened to Black Sabbath. It's happened to uh, thousands of bands. It's happened to me, where management will or <clears throat> or someone in the band sometimes will sort of sell off some of the licensing to some of the band's material. Yeah. And um, and then later on, like years later, uh, <clears throat> you think you're free and clear on some of those songs, those recordings, and you try to reissue them and you get a cease and desist from the label that has a per perpetuity deal with those songs. Yeah. And <clears throat> so then said label can that means that said label can put out a record full of songs that's legitimately you that have, at some point in your career you signed off on those those masters yep. just call them right yep they can put out a, they can put out crap looking artwork and crap you know what i mean and and box it up a thousand different ways and sell it and make the money off of it yeah to me that's as bad as a bootleg yeah now, <clears throat> now um that's a whole other can of worms. So, so let's, so we don't go another two hours. I have one more thing. Let's talk about, let's take it home for a second. So did you ever see death tripper or morbid termination? Oh my God. Play live in San Antonio when, when metal was hardcore and underground, we're talking 83, 84, 85, 86. Yeah. Um, I, I don't recall seeing, uh, death tripper. I may have, but I definitely recall seeing morbid termination, uh, nice. because the bass player in that band is one of my dearest fr lifelong friends. And that would be Mr. Al Kelly, who yes, sir. went on and played in a number of other bands, including Scythe and under no one and fourth Reich. But, um, I, re I, I remember seeing morbid termination back in the day. Um, I actually, the, the first time I recall seeing them, if I'm correct, it was a place called Q city and it was a pool hall. Hence you think Q city, right? You think it was a pool hall? <clears throat> I'm pretty city? sure. Even though when the gig went down, they had to move the pool tables off to the side, but. Well, see, I've done those where they just brought out pieces of plywood and put them on top of the <laughs> pool tables. And that was the fucking stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, good question. I love this because I actually have a bunch of flyers in a box that that feature uh, morbid termination and death tripper and some mm -hmm. of the, 
some of the bands from that time. But yes, to answer your question, um, very familiar with more of a termination. Uh, Just the because other, you're from San Antonio, and you're I'm from San Antonio, yeah. And, and and the guitar player, more of a termination. I can't I can't omit him. Was a guy named Ron Best, who mm. uh, was an incredible, incredible. And wait a minute. Um, am I confusing it with Fourth Reich? Or was Ron in uh, more of a termination? Yeah, I don't know. I can't. Uh, I can't yeah, jump I th- in and correct you on this because yeah. I, I don't recall all the names of the players. Uh, well, I remember I wanna... Jerry. Jerry from Death Tripper, and I remember uh, Al being a young, skinny little dude, and uh, and um, I remember. I can't think of his name. The morbid singer guy. I can't think of his name right now, but. Yeah. He was kind of a crazy, fun little dude. Yeah, he but wore the, the shoulder of, pads with the yep, nails sticking yep, out yep, of them. Yep, that was cool. Stuff. And yeah. and just a uh, Death Tripper was one of the first like death metal, like black metal bands, locally that I had ever heard, other than Necrovore, which was from San Marcos, which is like world famous, infamous maybe I should say, of like influencing like world renowned big black metal bands right here in central texas it's crazy yeah. right up the road from where i am now so i it's love cool. i love the name death tripper me too there was another band from that era in texas called hell preacher and i yeah. always thought that yep. name was great too mm-hmm. we should do a segment or we should do an episode on band names because i i i really appreciate the thought that goes into some of them and well you know we have the source material it's yeah. called the headbanger. Yeah, exactly. It's called headbangers. It's right there in your library. Yeah, um, exactly. that's my shot of rock and roll. I know it was a, a kind of a long one, but I guess that's okay, right? No, nah, that was great. I'm glad awesome. you brought up more of a termination and death yeah, stripper. But yeah, more of a termination is uh, has a little space in my heart because of my buddy Al Kelly. So yeah. Um, all right, uh, let's uh, wrap this one and uh, remind listeners that if you want to check out uh, T-shirts and swag, go to our website, talklouderpodcast.com. That's talklouderpodcast.com. You can get T-shirts, coffee mugs. Um, you can also find out a little bit about the show, and you'll find the links to our various platforms, iTunes, Spotify, etc. Meantime, until we see you next time, thanks for tuning in. I'm Metal Dave Glessner along with my co-host Jason McMaster. Thank you for listening. 